Over the last year, you may have tuned in to collaborations with my sister, Bea. Now we've created a podcast named Archetypes and the Planets, in which, episode by episode, we go through each of the planets and signs, exploring their archetypal roots and astrological meanings. This is the first episode of the new podcast, and if you use the link shown in the description, you can subscribe to the podcast itself and listen to future episodes. In fact, there are already two episodes published, one being this one on the sun, and then a second episode featuring the moon. If interested, please help us grow the podcast by subscribing and rating it, since doing so enables search engines to locate the podcast better. So one thing that I find really interesting uh, is something I've thought about for, for a long time, and which has been definitely, it's not my original idea, but it, it's something that's intriguing, which is the idea of uh, astrology or astronomy being the mother mythology. In other words, that everything, all of our gods, all of our mythologies have evolved from the act of human beings sitting outside and staring at the sky. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense because in the dark, things get pretty scary, especially in uh, in the kind of world that our uh, ancestors inhabited. And so uh, the and that's one thing. And then, of course, on the other side, it's that you're planning and your, your, your whole understanding of when to plant and when to reap and is also guided by by the stars and by what's going on. We, we have no time pieces. And so you get from very early on, and there's really good scholarship right now, which is intriguing about uh, how the paintings in uh, places like Lascaux, you know, these paintings that we've we've seen of bison, might actually be paintings that are depicting the, the, the sky above. That's what they were really tracking. And it makes sense because even by the, the time of the Babylonians, we know they knew about eclipses. They, they knew that certain things, certain movements were happening at a very regular level. And you can only do that if you're actually observing day after day after day. But what we're going to talk about, I hope, in this series of talks is what happened, uh, which is a monumental thing that happened uh, around the 5th century BCE with the development of astrology uh, by the Greeks. That's really when we first start seeing uh, the independent chart, for, uh, the first records. Actually, it's a little bit later, but there's the concept, because prior to that, I think, uh, it was used mostly by kings to 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 and the ruling class to basically um, predict what manner of catastrophe was before them or if they were going to win a particular war. But then by the time of the Greeks, you start seeing a whole bunch of change. But what's interesting to me is that it aligns so much with the change that seemed to have happened in the human brain. And that is that there's a lot of work to suggest that uh, post that time, we started developing more the left uh, side of the brain. This is work by Ian McGilchrist. And what's interesting about that, I mean, uh, the left uh, the left uh, brain is much more atomized. It's much more given to seeing the particulars. It's much more as, uh, aligned with symbolic systems than the right, which is more coherent and connecting and whatever. Here's what's interesting about it. The astrology we study, the, 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 the astronomy, astrology, call it what you want, the mythological system is solar-based, right? It's based on the sun. So far, so good. I mean, if you go to the Vedic system, it's moon-based, right? The solar, the, the development of this type of thinking is very particular to the West, okay? So we developed a type of thinking, even around a mythological system like astrology, that is very solar-based, which also coincides with the brain developing at this moment, uh, a series of, of um, uh, because of, you know, there's, there's McGilchrist's work is so interesting because it, there's a whole bunch of things that come into this, but you know, the, the, you see a very balanced brain around the fifth century BC, you have, you have philosophy, you have art, you have architecture, you have all these things flourishing in classical Greece. And then as time goes by, it becomes more atomized and it's more methodical. And then you get Plato and Aristotle who start talking about things like, well, it's not the real thing that matters is the representation or whatever. So it's really interesting. You start with basically what it gives you is perspective, but you start divorcing it from the body, from whatever. So let's go to the sun because the sun is the most important thing in the whole system, right? We would agree with that. Or do you think that's totally off base? Well, the sun, you know, it's funny that you said the Vedic system is moon-centered. I don't know that it's moon-centered. It sort of has a flavor of that, but it's pretty remarkable to say the moon is the center of the system. That would be like saying your backyard is the center of the world. I mean, the sun is so overwhelmingly dominant in its 
mass in the solar system, the rest of it is really flotsam. You know, it's really very, <laughs> yes, very, so. very small. The sun is 99.86% of the mass of the solar system. So uh, it is enormously, enormously dominant beyond, and, you know, people don't you know, sometimes get into the imagination of this and how incredibly tiny, even things like Jupiter and Saturn are, and they are next dominant such that what is left over, now that is definitely nothing but flotsam. So yeah, right. the sun is huge. And in addition, you'd have to say, the creation of the solar system originates from the sun. I mean, you can then start getting into theories of, you know, it came from outer space and uh, comets yeah. brought it up. That yeah. seems a little weird, especially considering the distances are so enormous. So then you would right. say, well, in this particular backyard, so to speak, the sun is the origin. And you could easily say we're solar beings because yeah, yeah. without the sun, uh, no way for anything to happen. Even if you say uh, life is you know based on water, which is a certain temperature and so forth. No sun, no life, no nothing. Yeah, nothing. Period, right? So the right. sun is it, you know, in that sense. Right. Yes. So interesting, just to take from that, one of the things that I find most interesting and for people who want to follow this is there's a publication of a book here in Canada that caused quite a stir. This is probably back in about 20, 2007 called The Pagan Christ where uh, uh, an actual scholar, an Anglican scholar, went back and, and uncovered um, essays that have been published in the 19th century, making it very clear something that the church has known and probably anybody who's educated had known, that most of our um, mythologies, religious systems, are really solar myths that have been recycled, right? This is why uh, a lot of our gods are born on December 25th. And it's tied to what you just said, the sun. The sun is so central that what happens in the Northern Hemisphere, when I'm talking about this, let's be very clear, we study the Northern Hemisphere uh, version of astrology. So it's all from our perspective on this part of the earth, right? And so if we all know that on the 22nd of December, that sun is at its lowest point. It kind of looks like it stops in the sky. It disappears. And then three days later on the 25th, aha, it starts coming back up. And this is where our solar mythologies come from. I mean, there's so many other correspondences. For example, the virgin birth, very common. The idea of uh, resurrection, very common. Uh, the idea of the mother and son in a certain specific. Uh, it, it's it, They're all motifs that are tied to looking at the sky. And the, the thing about the sun, as you say, is without the sun, you can't plant, you can't, you don't exist. You die when the sun dies, we all die. That's over. It's like there's nothing right. else left, right? Exactly. And so what's interesting about it to me, see what you think about this, is that in the 20th century, when you know we, we we've talked about this before, so let's just re reiterate uh, is, is astronomy really till the 16th century. Most of the astrologers are astronomers. That includes uh, one of the things you can do if you go to Florence is you can see the square because there used to be square charts um, that uh, Galileo drew for his own chart, and you can you, you know the Kepler was was although he was the one that first started questioning some things, but he was still an astrologer. So was um, Isaac Newton. But there was a split, right? As we became more left brain, this is a 16th century uh, or 17th century uh, phenomenon. And, and so then the mythology split away from the mathematical part of it, which is a, a shame because I love the mathematical part. I know you do too. But the mythological is, is clearly just as interesting. And it's, it's what connects us, right, to our stories. And so it, it goes underground for a bit. And then in the 19th century, it gets re reinvented. We, we uh, not reinvented, but it gets reinterpreted, it comes out through the theosophists. And in the 20th century, you get this phenomenon that wasn't around before, which is sun sign astrology. Basically, the one thing most people know is their birth date. So it's very easy to look in a column and say, oh, I'm born, I'm an Aries, I'm a Capricorn, I'm this, right? So it was very clear. You start that, you give general co concepts of what a Capricorn, of course, anybody who's ever looked or studied this knows a, and a chart is an incredibly complex thing and that there are so many different types of people, but it was an easy way to bring it in. Right. And yet what's happened with the revival recently, which has been a very good one, we're, we're uncovering texts from the Arabic period and uh, um, and we're, we're uh, from, sorry, from Arab astrologers who really maintained the tradition um, back in, in the Middle Ages when the West sort of went into a dormancy period. Um, what was What's interesting about it is that there is a reevaluation. So the sun, this whole sun sign thing becomes a bit of an embarrassment, which it is, because if you're just looking at those kind of generalizations, it's silly, right? But still, we talk about that with the sun, it, it's everything, right? So, so let's look in the chart, right? When you're when you're looking at it as a system, what is the sun? Uh, I'll talk about the mythological and big, but what does the sun represent to you? I mean, what are the what are the things that you you talk about when you talk about the sun in any chart, whether it's a mundane chart or a human, you know, a person or, you know, a business, what is it it's showing us? Uh, the sun shows, shows the, the core being of the person and you tie it to 
big important concept like your your core vitality for example so it often will get linked to a person's overall health because vitality is is tied to that life purpose um your your deep willpower the sense of what you are really here for your your and that's what purpose would be and you know that you can then talk about the tribe as in your son is in capricorn your son is in sagittarius that's the flavor of that but the symbol itself is absolutely critical one of the ways you know that the sun is really dominant in a chart is that for the most part to my understanding the transits to it so when you're experiencing a period say saturn uranus whatever they tend to be uh more more important more powerful more impactful uh, yes, there will be exceptions when something else gets transited. But the sun is really dominant. As an example, I use this all the time, bread and butter. You take where the sun is in the birth chart, just look at where Saturn is transiting. And when it's in conjunction, square, opposed that sun, people generally complain. You know, yeah, they're not happy yeah. when that's happening. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, it's a very primary symbol even though, you know, you draw the chart and there's this little circle there and there might be a, you put Pluto and you make it bigger and it, you know, makes it seem like you know, yeah. Pluto is running the chart. So, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, a yeah, hugely important uh, symbol. And you could argue for, yes, it's true what you said, sun sign astrology is really bringing it down to a popular level. And then you could also say, if you took someone's uh, sun in a chart, and looked at the angles it's making to other planets you have a pretty good read on what that person is like that's also right, true right so right. both of those are, right. are working at the same time so i would add that if from a mythological level right let me bring in what it's aligned to so the one god since this is a system that really really was was developed we think in hellenistic uh by the hellenistic greeks right or the hellenistic period i should say um the the god that is most often associated with the sun uh, is Apollo. That's the god of, um, um, and he's kind of an interesting character, right? Because there's a whole bunch of things about him that would point to what this might, the sun might mean in a person's chart. And I and I credit um, uh, Liz Green, who is the great Jungian astrologer slash scholar slash everything, who really worked this through the mythological lens, right? And Apollo is, of course, um, Apollo and Artemis are, um, are are the the twins that are born on the island of Delos, Delos. And and that's already telling us a bit because the island of Delos was considered the center of the uh, of kind of the known world at the time. So already you're saying, okay, here's the god that's associated with the center, which means this is the center, the, the centering principle in some way. But Apollo is really interesting because he's also the god of, of healing and music, right? And and you think, okay, well, what do those two have to do with the sun and the purpose, right? And um, well, first of all, I think music will point to one thing, which is that. One thing I associate with the sun, see if you agree with this, is that to be fully ourselves, and I'm going to reference um, Joseph Campbell here, you have to find what your purpose is. And the sun, as a solar principle, right, and it rules Leo, which is the most sort of individual of the signs, it's really, you're not working with the collective at that point. To be who you are often means you are going in, in, you're going to be opposing maybe your family values, maybe your societal values. So Joseph Campbell, who, by the way, had sun exalted in Aries because he was a great example, and he charted something called the hero's path, which is a very Aries kind of thing to do. Um, but but he would say, look, the, the, the hero starts, uh, it doesn't follow anybody's path. They make their own path in the forest where it's darkest. And the moment you follow anyone else's path, you're not being your son. You're not actualizing that. And what um, I think Liz Green points out too, and I think you've probably been seeing it in practice, being consulting for many years, is that those who do not are not able to express their solar light because their family or because of fear or their society are often suffer depression or they suffer, uh, they, they, they don't live their life in the way they want to live it because fundamentally they are not allowing their light to show uh, through. And it's not an easy journey. And, and of course, then you we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, personal charts that then have maybe Pluto square the sun or whatever, but it's going to, it's not an easy path, but it's a necessary path because it is tied to, that is what makes you truly an individual. What, do you, what Does that ring true to you? It does. It does. And the thing is, yes, purpose, purpose is critical. Now, where it becomes uh, a little tricky is if you say you go against the collective, perhaps at times. And yet, if you do that without being well related to the collective, you know, well integrated, which 
ironically, often happens from states of being receptive and being, uh, you could say, more peaceful, more settled, right. whereupon your purpose dawns on you, so to speak. And so then you express it because if you think of it as, well, I'm just going to go against the collective, this is where you get in a way the manifestation of egohood where a person right. decides, well, this is me. And they just, you know, they start running around like a bull in a China shop and that can have a value. You can get pretty far, but you mostly irritate people and so forth because they see the ego more than they see what you would call a true solar, true divine purpose. Right. right. Um, so I think that's important because uh, otherwise there can be confusion around you know, understanding the, the so-called deeper purpose of the sun. Um, right. So, so, but what I was thinking more, and maybe it, it, it connects to what you said, is like, let's say the, the case of a person who is born in a family where to be a lawyer is to fit in the family mold and you decide you, you'd rather meditate in the Himalayas. Uh, Ram Das is a good example of someone who broke away from a family who had a determined path. I mean, that is just that, that what I'm saying more in that context is sometimes the path we would like to choose runs in, in con contradicts the one that our families would like us to choose because families have their own, you know, dynamics. They have their own security consciousness. And this is one of the big things with the son. I think the son has got to break away from the parents at some point. I mean, this is part of the, the job of the son is to become an independent light, right? And, and the other mm -hmm. thing to mention is that in the mythology, uh, we have to remember Apollo is not the son. Apollo is the carrier of the son. We are not mm -hmm. the son. We're carrying a spark of the divine, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we express it in whatever little way we can because you know we're limited as humans. But the point is, it is not the sun itself. It's a vehicle for the expression of something that's very individual. And frankly, something very individual could be very weird to the outer, outer culture, but you may be doing really good. I mean, you may be the kind of person that is obsessed with, the, like the guy, I always think of people who seem so odd, but are so admirable, like the guy that decided he was gonna knit, knit little booties for uh, these penguins out uh, who, who, got, who were getting cold. <laughs> I thought that was so great. It's like, this is fantastic. It, it is like, that is what makes him passionate. He's doing some good that nobody can see, right? Um, and, and this is what I'm saying to others that may seem insane, right? But the idea is that we're following whatever our heart calls out to us because like, the sun also rules the heart. And so it's a heart's path. And your heart's path, the left-hand path, as, as Campbell used to talk about, which when he said, follow your bliss, can be difficult because that's what I'm saying, that it might put you in opposition. It's not an ego thing. It puts you in opposition to what others might want from you, right? Um, but but of course, no, it's not like egotism on, on a high level, like I must do what I want and I must be a narcissist. Actually, the narcissism that can evolve from, from uh, someone who follows that kind of path is, I think, a son that's damaged, frankly. It's, it wasn't allowed to express its light and therefore it becomes narcissistic because it's constantly looking to express it in, in one way or another. But point well taken. Yeah, it's not, I, I, I think what we're talking about is just a person's ability to be who they are really meant to be. And I think to some degree, the sun will tell you what the story is. Now, here's another thing I've noticed. See if you, you agree with this. It seems to be harder for people to express their sons than anything else in the charts, right? It's almost like the taking on of that particular uh, archetype is difficult, more difficult than it would be in, in other ways. Maybe because it is so daunting. I don't know if that's the case, but what, what's your take on that? Oh, well, I would say that it's it's not difficult to express it. It's difficult to express it well, okay. to express mm -hmm. it in a way that is perhaps to go to the Apollo. You know, it's interesting that the Apollo archetype and why would healing show up there? Like healing is the idea of being whole, being complete. Yes, uh, yes. And so if you're not really complete, then you'll express it in ways that are not complete. And so it comes off uh, distorted in some way. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's harder. And one of the ways uh, to tune into this, you may have seen those drawings of the Kabbalah, the Jewish system where the sun is at the center, but in, in that sense, it radiates everywhere and the planets are around it in different ways. But to get to it, you go through at least two steps, actually ascendant and moon are in front of the sun right, right. and Mercury and Venus are sort of off to the side. So to get to it, yes, it's not uh, immediate. It's not a, not a simple thing. And this is why people, for example, will often express their ascendant in their moon when they're, when they're younger, more, uh, more so than the sun. The, the right. sun is something that I think requires a certain amount of maturity. Although the paradox with the sun went back again to Apollo is he's 
Polo is often pictured holding a musical instrument because mm -hmm. he's connected to music. So it's a playful thing. Children, oh, yeah. sixth house, son. So one way you could say, in order to discover your true purpose, ask yourself, well, what, what gives me joy? What yeah. Yeah. feels like yeah. I'm playing? Literally, you know, instead of all this serious, you know, I'm here yeah, to do yeah. something yeah, really yeah. important. What's the essence of it around something that is interesting, joyful and fun? which itself can be horribly corrupted as well, because a person can come up with an answer for that. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, yeah, of course. The purpose. But right. if, it's, if it's deep joy in the true yeah. sense, then absolutely it connects to the sun. You know, I always say to people, having run a group for many years, that um, it, it, the, the things that give you joy, you should not tie to career, you should not tie to, to uh, necessarily making money, which is, I think, what our society does, which makes it very difficult for people mm -hmm. to express their passion. Because somehow in this society, if you're not being rewarded monetarily or through fame or some some outwardly measure, because we're a measuring society and, and not a connecting society, then I think people feel like a failure. And yet what I say, and this is what I've always, um, in my own novels, this is what I focused on, the characters who, what drives me is what people's obsessions are about. Because I always notice what people love. I don't know about you, but I always think that is so interesting. Why are they so interested in this particular corner of the world that nobody's noticed, right? And often that isn't rewarded, but that doesn't matter because as you say, the other thing that's interesting is Venus, which is one of the, the uh, it's called, you know, the, the uh, lesser benefic, joys in the fifth house because there is a level of play. Yes, of joy, of, of reward. Now, here's another thing that's interesting about the sun, which I think has to be pointed out. We have a, a, an astrology that is based in the West, right? Very solar centered. It's also very masculine centered because the sun is a masculine or a yang planet, as some people don't like the word masculine, but it's an active, it's action oriented. It's not receptive because unlike the moon, it never changes, right? The moon has faces. The sun is the one thing that is there. It's not going to, unless one day it dies and it will, um, it is not a changeable thing in, in flux. It is always outwardly oriented. And so it kind of makes sense to me that it would be considered exalted in Aries, which again speaks to, it's. I mean, I know the ancients did it because it's trying its position in Leo, which it rules. But if you look at it a little bit more metaphorically and deeply, which is why I think this is worth having, this conversation is worth having, it's an action oriented and Mars is the ruler of Aries. So of course, this is the place that's going to support action. It's going to be out there. It's not particularly receptive. It is actually more about expression, right? And so again, I think that's difficult for people. Let, let's, let's also bring in introversion versus extroversion. It might be easier for an extrovert. To, to express their son than an introvert in a way that is more, again, in a way that is more uh, easily received by the society they're part of. And I think this is more a Western problem than an Eastern problem, right? I think the Eastern, Eastern mentality understands that meditation and contemplation is actually a very valid way, but I don't think the West in traditionally has been as oriented that, that way, right? So this is another aspect of it, that it's actually representing our active, our, the principle of taking action. Does that ring true to you? It does. It definitely does. Uh, yes. Uh, the only thing we have to be careful, though, is that then you start getting into sometimes core archetypes or core, you know, archetype being the sort of the, the essence of something in a certain way. You can then sometimes get contradictions you have to resolve. So, yes, the sun as a masculine symbol, Mars, same thing, action orientation, although you would say... For example, a woman has that uh, archetype within herself as well, oh, just yeah. like a man oh, has yeah. the other, the female archetypes. But the thing is the sun in its most uh, fundamental sense, when you say the heart, the heart is the sun. And in the deepest teachings I can think of around um, uh, enlightenment, you know, reaching the pinnacle of oneself, there's a sense in that consciousness awareness resides in the heart rather than in the right. mind right and then you're saying well that's that's pure being you're just being well if you're just being you're automatically in some sense receptive as well in other words yep. you're getting beyond any kind of right left brain speculations you're just being so there's that as well to consider because you could argue that a person's deepest fulfillment can only come in their pure being everything else is a kind of um restlessness you know they're looking yeah, around yeah, yeah. if i can just find the perfect argument then i'll know everything yeah. and then you get things like remember that that uh novel from way long ago the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy yes. where the computer says the solution is 49 okay great well <laughs> now 
You've got it. I'll change in two minutes. Yes. <laughs> Go from there. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I totally agree with you. That's a really good point about the brilliance because the whole point of this system is that it's based on light. And there's yes. nothing brighter than the sun. That's the whole thing, right? And right. and I agree with you also. It's a really interesting point you just made about the heart. But when I think of someone being very involved with something they're passionate about, time disappears. They are connected to their heart. They are in pure being. Mm-hmm. I think where yes. people get caught in their mind is when they start getting into these mind trips about, well, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be doing that. And so mm-hmm. the, 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 the sun purely expressed is actually why it's so powerful, because it loses contact with time. It's not constrained by the problems of Saturn. It is yes. expressing itself freely. And, and, and that is why I think a lot of the meditations that, let's say, the Sufis do are, are on the heart, because you're connecting to that part of yourself that does not need to be overridden by some crazy thought that you have in your head, right? So absolutely mm-hmm. and truly, I'm mm-hmm. just pointing out that I think, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this when we do the episode on the moon, that I think a lot of the demonization of the dark, of the feminine, of what's associated with the moon, with with it, which then gets projected solely onto women. Although I think you made a point that before I go down this line, I must go return to, I don't want to forget it. The reason that I think an astrological chart, a map, is so important is that we bypass gender categories. We bypass a lot of categories that are artificially constructed by our societies, right? In other words, we all have masculine. We all have feminine. We all have Mercury. We all have Venus. It is. It, it doesn't matter what the gender is. What matters is how are you living each of these realities? So get back to the moon and the sun. The sun is not demonized in our culture. It is like, yes, we all want to be in the sun. We all want to be recognized. We all want to be in the light. Whereas the moon traditionally in the dark where a lot of reflection happens, where a lot of deep thinking happens, has been demonized. You know, this is, it's been taken and said, oh, the feminine is inferior, and therefore we are now going to subjugate women. And and it it can be projected onto that and has been projected. And I realize even the words become politicized, right? Dark is really bad. You shouldn't use the word dark. And yet the reason they came about was that we evolved at a time when being in the dark was dangerous. That's just it. But yeah. in the dark is also where wonderful things come alive. The planets are are visible to us. We're able, uh, the storytelling happens in the dark. There's so many things that can happen as well. But we tend to denigrate that part of our existence because the, the sun is so important. It takes over the whole story, really. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. I, I, the thing, you know, what that brings up for me is that when you're looking at uh, archetypes, planets, one of the things that I do is, Try to focus on always raise the level and go higher and higher. For example, uh, t- to my understanding, you take the idea of planets that seem to represent something, like Saturn seems to represent contraction, Jupiter seems to represent expansion, and not just represent, it's actually the way they operate in the world. And then the Sun seems to represent, as we said earlier, uh, pure being, life purpose, and so forth. But they're in a universe. I mean, science itself tells you what's going on in a you know, pretty great measure these days. You know that, for example, there are many, 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 many suns out there. There are far more suns than people, far like ridiculously more, yeah, gazillions right. of trillions of septillions, right? However, science also tells you that all that light out there is 5% of the universe. Five percent. In fact, maybe even less. So that means when you say, well, there's something wrong with dark. Well, 95 percent of the universe is dark. Yeah. And they even call it dark energy. And they say this dark energy, 75 percent of the universe is dark energy, seems to be driving everything because something in there is expanding everything to who knows where it's going. So (laughs) obviously nothing wrong with dark. However, it as we exist, it's also true uh, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard it. We're made of stardust, therefore we're solar material. So people really relate to the idea of illumination. When when people are talking about enlightenment, there you go, light. light yeah. You become illuminated. Oh, that person has a lot of light. That person is exuding that, which is solar in principle. So you yeah. play yeah. with both those principles. But I've actually seen and heard great masters take the opposite point of view and talk about, well, why do you have to focus so much on light? Focus on darkness, it's even better. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You can, yeah. <laughs> well, well, of course, you know, in the Jungian yeah. worldview, um, everything comes from the dark. In other words, everything comes from the feminine. It comes from the undifferentiated mass. And what light right. does is it separates, which we need, by the way, because if you don't separate, then everything's just a muddle, a cauldron. But once you separate it, uh, you have to find a way to join it up again. That's the problem. Yes. That's the step most people do not take, and we don't take in our current way of thinking. And so we're talking now mythologically, and you know, a scientist will come on and say, well, this is rubbish. 
but that's because they don't know poetry. That is because they don't value a mythological way. No, they don't. They, yeah. they, they, it's, they live in an either or world. Like you and I can both agree that we both love science. That's what actually my PhD, abandoned PhD, was in the history of medicine. So I love, I love science, but I'm also a person who writes novels. And what's tragic is this either or way of thinking, which you can't do and you can't, you can't do both. And both address different needs, right? One explains yeah. the universe in, in a way that is the separating function that separates and quantifies and catalogs. And the other actually connects things. They says, look, the stories right. that we tell, like I've always said, you know, people don't line up um, generally, right? They line up for Star Wars for a reason, because it's a story that connects you to a, to, a, to a larger view of what humanity is about. It's doing it metaphorically. It's not doing it by telling you you know, facts, because facts can get pretty boring unless you can connect them into something that's that's beautiful. The other thing that we should mention with the sun, and I think this is a really important point to make, and I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, Joseph Campbell's work here, is that in the sun and our solar myths, nothing happens without a struggle, okay? All the solar gods must fight either a snake or, a large, you know, something. Something is put in their way as a trial. And that to me also shows me a little bit about what the solar purpose is in, in an individual chart, that it doesn't come easily. You're not going to go out there and suddenly someone's going to say, oh, it is something you have to work at. And, and this comes in, I think, can, can dovetail very nicely with what you were saying about how it's really important to have a notion of enlightenment that goes beyond um, just the standard idea, right? In other words, that by doing or having practices in your life, that allow you to connect to your deeper self, I think it's harder, it's easier, sorry, not to battle with yourself and, and not to battle with the world because you understand more of, about yourself. You understand enough to know that it's worth, it's what you're doing is worth it. Like if I, I don't know about you because you're a consulting astrologer. I mostly just run a group. I'm, I'm not on that side. But what I see as a general principle that holds people back is not the battle with the outer world, but the inner battle with themselves, you know, the inability to take on their own solar light because they're too busy criticizing the fact that they're not good enough or whatever, or that they haven't even clarified. Have you not heard this many times? Well, I don't know what to do, even from people who are 60. I don't know what to do with my life. And it's like, okay, well, there has to be some introspection here, right? There has to be some clarity that is internally driven, right? But I'm taken by the notion, I wonder what you would think about this notion that all solar heroes and myths are given tasks that are extremely difficult. And it's by no means assured they will survive because the whole point is that the struggle is real, you know? Yeah, I can relate to that. I can totally relate to that, back to that thing from earlier, back to that correlation with the, you know, the Kabbalistic tree where the sun is the center and, and there's a journey to it. And it's interesting that you're crossing through the ascendant and the moon. Uh, it's the idea you're grounded, you exist on earth, and moon tends to correlate with your day-to-day -day habits, affairs, the things that you do. Of course, you have to realize too that the moon, the only th reason you see the moon is because of sunlight. So there's that as well. That's right. Like it's reflected. But nonetheless, for sure, yes, that that the idea that there's a journey uh, is, is totally true. And you could even bring the polarity in the way uh, polarities work Saturn tends to be placed on the other side of the sun as the, the sort of the natural opposite yeah. in a certain way as the first ruler of Aquarius, if you put the sun in Leo. And that makes sense because Saturn is the idea of form. The fact that you have a body, that you exist in time temporarily is very Saturnian. And now you're going to do something. Well, of course, you're in a limited state. So uh, it would be so great. You just pop into existence in limited state. And now you're a genius uh, solar field. It doesn't work that way, no. Uh, sometimes you get people who are incredibly talented early on, and yet typically uh, when they haven't gone through a journey, uh, uh, usually of some you know difficulty, they tend to run into problems later. Or maybe they you know they're super creative early on, and then they don't have the uh, you know complete package to to live a, live a long life and so forth. So yes, uh, that absolutely makes sense to me. Yes. It's really interesting. You know, the one thing that Jung wrote about in Ion was the procession of the equinoxes and why, they, they, of course, this keeps changing. This is the idea that every 2,000 years, what's rising uh, Aries, a point in the eastern horizon, is rising uh, one degree later every 72 years, basically. And and, the, mm -hmm. and the, the ancients figured this out, which just makes me realize just how sophisticated their thinking was, no matter what we like to dismiss this. And uh, the thinking is that every time there's a shift which every age, because of course the boundaries are not set, they're fluid in, in the sky, so you can't say, well, now it's Aquarius. And now, 
But every 2000 years or so, we get a change in the God myth, right? So you go from a God myth that's the bull and you're, you're depicting bulls and you have Hathor, which is an Egyptian uh, myth. And then, you know, you go to the uh, Aries myth and then you're suddenly uh, the ram is the big thing. And then, of course, once we head into Pisces, it's the fish. And so there's a lot of talk about, well, we're moving into an Aquarian age, which may have happened already in 1900, according to Stephen Forrest. It may happen in 200 years later, according to uh, Carl Jung, who knows, because nothing in the sky is fixed, right? The, the boundaries are not fixed. Um, but what's interesting to me is the idea that the humans do need, we humans do need an image that is a central uh, unifying image that we can also respond to, because when these myths are created, they're not really limited to one part of the world. They seem to be taken on. Aspects of them are taken on by, by many cultures. And so to me, again, we go back to the idea that the, these mythologies, for whatever reason, are there to show us kind of a way forward. And, and so in a larger sense, maybe our myths of where we, where, we, where we are projecting our gods are telling us a little bit about where we're developing as a human race. And not always it's not always an evolution. It could be a devolution. We've seen that, right? It's not always mm -hmm. empires fall and then we, we go into the muck again. So it's not like it's always progressive. It's just telling us what we're paying attention to at a given time. Right, what the mythology is telling, what what the mythologies of the time are telling us, and so I think of a, an individual map, and I think, well, that is also maybe telling you where you park your own mythological system, what you are paying attention to, right? And so to look at the sun for me, I mean, you got you got to look at the whole thing, and it's a complicated thing, but to look at the sun, I think, should give you a clue as to just what kinds of things, what spark, what divine spark you are carrying for the collective, right? And uh, if you're carrying it, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're probably, and this is interesting in the stories and, and the, the plays that were written about Apollo. Ap uh, Apollo fundamentally is the way you heal, right? The way you heal others is by healing yourself first, which means it is overcoming a lot of the things that are that uh, that that do not allow that 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 uh, that that spark to happen, that that divine spark to to take place. And that's where I think courage, and that's why it's exalted in Mars. Courage also is tied to the word heart. So to to be to be courageous and the lion, you know, you got to be courageous. You got to go out there. You got to make sure. Actually, someone once said, I don't know what you think, but that the Wizard of Oz basically had all the archetypes embedded. You know, you could just study the Wizard of Oz and understand all of them from the lion to you know. It has a lot of what because most of our great stories are already telling us this is what you what you what you need to do to be able to uh, to to. Um, uh, become who you really are meant to be, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's it's really interesting to me that it was so denigrated because it became sort of yellow German kind of, you know, degraded. Um, I'm just going to read these. Although people who do these things, I mean, you know, they, 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 they're quite clever at times and they, and they, they, they're by no means, you don't want to dismiss it outright, but it does, I think, simplify it to a level that it, that it takes away some of the, the real deep nature of what this language is about. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I felt that way, that to reduce things to categories, what we're doing is what the left brain in the McGoakers model, by the way, and that's the only way I'm using it, it likes to categorize and systematize. Suddenly you're saying, and by the way, this is what's great about this, this language. It both has a left brain component. You have to know a lot of, you have to understand basic geometry. You're not going to be able to understand how these planets relate to each other, but it has to have the connecting the story that I think the solar the part is the story that you connect out of you put these pieces together and you create a narrative, right? Like let's say you're doing a reading. It, it yes, you can look at all the, the aspects and the quintiles and whatever you want to look, okay? Whatever whatever you look at when you're doing that. But out of that, you're constructing a narrative. You're creating a story for the person to understand themselves better. Am I right on that? Or oh no, absolutely. Yeah. The whole idea is 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 to spot the uh get a sense of where the person's journey is uh, in terms of their outlook, what they are trying to um, let go of, bring in, and then tie it to the archetypal nature of the chart and suggest or you know open conversation about well, what about this? What about that? To to tune into those archetypes, which could be a big move or just a next step. But yes, no, absolutely true. Now the thing you said about the complications that arise, like around you know, left brain, right brain, uh, how you can get contradictions, at least as I interpret it when you're talking about this, because you were mentioning the nature of the system where you say there, there's procession and you're looking at the sky and then there's the changing of the gods. But here's, here's the thing though, uh, tropical astrology is essentially very sun-based because 
In tropical astrology, what you say is, it doesn't matter what this guy does, at the zero uh, at the zero spring point, when spring starts, that's zero Aries, right? No matter what. Yeah. So that 100 years from now, uh, that's no longer zero Aries, it's 29 Pisces, but that person is still zero Aries. Now, it turns out, in my experience across decades, I've tried to really pay attention to this. Are people their constellational sign, more their constellational sign, or their tropical sign? I'm convinced the tropical system mm -hmm. reflects it better. For example, you will see, if you pay attention, you'll notice that the lunar position in the sky tends to represent where the public mood is of the tropical moon. And there are moments when it's so clear that, you know, for example, the moon will be in Virgo, but it's still in Leo in the previous sign. And you're in a room and suddenly people start talking spontaneously for some reason, but who knows what the reason is. They'll start talking about agriculture that's and cool. methods of planting. And you realize that's not Leo, that's Virgo. Mm -hmm. Or Gemini instead of Taurus. And they're not talking finance. They're talking about names and naming or some kind of communication thing. So uh, this tells you that the tropical signs are uh, seem to reflect it better, but therefore the solar principle. So it's as though somehow, which I don't, I don't, I'll confess, I don't understand what the logic is. It's as though you might say, well, astrology began through observing the constellations and you put them in these boxes and then you see they're moving backward. And yet it's as though through a laser beam, you know, down into the earth plane or whatever, what you're getting is the precise archetypes, Aries is spring, Taurus follows it, like forevermore. Uh, and, and by the way, another thing that's very interesting, it gets reflected in the way people look as well. That is what is really strange. <laughs> yes. You'll see a person who say early Pisces, and you'd think, okay, this person is really an Aquarius and they, you know, they have like four or five plants in Pisces and they have a, a fish-like something that is pretty obvious, right? <laughs> so then you realize, yeah, they're incarnated in that sense, yeah. which to my mind is very solar because it's reflecting the tropical. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, and this is tropical astrology, by the way, there's nothing funnier than uh, every once in a while, the New York Times doesn't do this anymore, but there was a time they would you know, periodically rehash, oh, astrologers don't know about procession. It's like, yeah, no, astrologers, we you know, Ptolemy, I mean, we've known that for years, and because you just don't understand that tropical astrology is not based, it's based on the equinoxes and the solstices, has nothing to do with with the uh, sidereal astrology, which is based on the map of the sky, right? But again, that also speaks of how it does not take it, this is not something that's taken seriously, because I guess the metaphorical thinking, which is what my passion is about, if someone said, well, what, what are you here to do? I'm trying to get people to think metaphorically. And I think with the map of, of this nature, you can allow people to understand, you know what, go into a subway stop and look for Venus and see where you find Venus and see if you're seeing some Mars behavior, right? You get to know the planets through watching behavior. Yes. And then of course, even more subtly, watch it within within yourself as well. Um, but but going back to your 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 uh, contention about the the tropical nature, we again again it's a solar based astrology. That's the way right. it was developed. I'm going to give you. I'm going to propose what I think Jung would say to this because you know Jung had to be very very circumspect about what he was doing with astrology because astrology you know it was considered just something for crazy people. And so he would do it. He would write letters, but he you know he was clear he was doing. And of course you know Freud would have like oh this is the occult. Stop it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but you know one of the concepts that that um, that's very famously associated with with Jung is the concept of synchronicity. So I'm a I'm a novelist primarily, right? And so what I think about is that what if what if that this is like a little bit like um, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide in the sense that we are creating a world that is creating us at the same time. In other words, that what the above is reflecting the below. The Hermeticist said this for you know for ages. And that really, and, and that the mystery religions, this is what's happened. The mystery religions always knew this, right? But the mystery religions were always um, uh, persecuted. Why? Because most mystery religions give you back the authority over your own inner self. And if you're going to provide a structure by which I will exploit you, you can't you can't give authority to the human being. You've got to take it away, right? So this is always understood by the mystery traditions. And so the way I look at it as a story, as a narrative, because I hate when people say, well, prove it. I'm not proving, I can't prove it. That you're to, you're trying to apply, and I don't want to simplify left brain and right and right brain. That's brain lateralization is actually a very complicated thing. But what I'm saying is that I think um, the poetic understanding of what's going on here is we're not atomizing. We're saying yes. Look, you're looking at a map, but the map tells a story. Just like a, a map can tell a story, you can read, see a map 
of like, you know, whatever, Canada and say, okay, well, what, what this vast land, let's make a story about what this vast land is about. And so the idea is that you're allowing your metaphorical ability to see something. And then weirdly, and this is what nobody can understand, is there seems to be a correspondence between what's out there and what's inside and what manifests. And we don't know how that is. We don't know the mechanism. Like I said, Jung used the word synchronicity to, to um, designate any time that an outer event or an inner reality is reflected in the outer reality, right? And he said those were very, very big moments. Like here's a nothing thing he said, which I think you would probably agree with. The more you're attuned to this happening in the world, the more this happens. So I always say to people, if you understand it's going on, right, you start seeing it in a very big way. But if you are closed off, if your idea is, no, I will not allow this concept of an animated universe in Richard Tarnas's words to enter my conceptual universe, then of course nothing is going to happen. Everything you will see, and we know this politically, we've seen this confirmed, not to get into it because that's not our game here, but we've seen that people will find confirmation bias for anything that they believe in. And they will just they will just silo themselves and believe in it. So I think what we're trying to propose, what I hope we're doing in this series is to say, if you allow for an animated view of the universe, right? For a universe that is connected, then somehow things become connected. It's one of those things that until you open your mind to the idea of the possibility, it can't happen. What do you think about that? Well, I agree. Although I would also add, they are connected regardless. It's just that oh, yeah, when you for allow sure. for it, you'll, you'll notice the connections. If you don't That's allow it. for it, you won't notice them. So for example, take a person who says, oh, this stuff is all oh, garbage. Come on, you're making it up. It's not true. And then Imagine in a, let's just propose a, a hypothesis where an astrologer is watching this person, you know, constantly and they're taking notes and they basically then tell the tale of what they were doing and what was happening. And you will see all kinds of astrological correlations that they were engaging in, which anybody that knows astrology realizes, yes, that's exactly right. And so the connections are there when you allow for them, then you notice them and they enrich your sense of self, your sense of being. Otherwise, if this were not true, you could never look back at, well, where was Pluto in the 18th century and what was it doing? You know, that's something you're looking back and you can say this this ha happened in accordance with where Pluto was. I remember in my uh, first contact with astrology, what really got me going was that I looked back seven years before I'd ever seen a chart or knew what it, this was about. And I noticed there were correlations. You know, there was a stomach thing and I thought, okay, this is strange. Why is that? Why is Saturn opposing my moon? right when I'm having, you know, really opposing it in a station at a moment of a stomach crisis. Strange, right? So then you think that was happening before I was aware. So had I been aware, I would have noticed, well, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm having this problem because of this. So to my mind, the connections exist and the enrichment comes if you allow for them to be there so you can notice them. And it, then it becomes, in a sense, a magical universe because it is a little strange, you know, to say, <laughs> yeah. I feel this way because Mars, you know, for example, uh, when you said you notice them inside, this is 100% true. I'll notice in myself when Mars is around, I, I get at least internally combative. I might become <laughs> externally combative, but I certainly get internally combative. This is <laughs> <Yes>. totally true. <laughs> yes, we know. <So>, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, which is good because also, by the way, this is part of why I... My 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 primary orientation has been towards the you know, the work of Jung, and you know as he said, when you become uh, aware of certain things, you can't unsee them. You can't. You know, this is the Pluto problem. You saw it. Don't unsee it. It's still there. You know, you, you can talk about whatever measurement you want. It's still there. And so it, it's a great way to for self realization because you once you're aware of certain patterns, mm -hmm. you can actually start correcting them. Otherwise, you're just projecting them and making people miserable in the outer world, which is hopefully what we don't want to do. I do want to finish with this, and I think the problem with archetypal anything is that archetypes can be expressed in many, many, many varied ways. And so I get also annoyed with people saying, we'll prove it because you're not going to be able, we are entering a, a language, a way of being, a way of seeing things, which are not fixed in space. It is not going to always manifest this way. And, and the point is you can engage with this language only if you're willing not to fix things in space in, in a very deterministic way. And this mm -hmm. is also very hard for human beings, right? Because they want certainty because they're fearful. And mm -hmm. I think for me, the language is great because it says, look, there is this connecting thing. You are aware of it. But if you're a fearful person, 
and you're using it in that in that way, then it's just going to make you more fearful. Frankly, if you look mm-hmm. at it in an archetypal way, we don't know how things are going to exactly express. There is a flavor. There is a weather. There is kind of a storm front or maybe a, a, a nice sunny day. But the point is, you're, you're not going to know. And, and so I guess I'm arguing against the idea of trying to prove anything that you're entering, that we're using a language that doesn't submit itself to that because that's not what it's about. It is, I guess, what we just talked about, which what, what makes it beautiful for me is that there are very few connecting languages beyond poetry and music. Music is a great one, which by the way, being ruled by Apollo makes sense because music is one of the ways that we're able to express grief, that we're able to process things that that are hard to hard to process actually in the world. So um and and so it, it to me the, the the beauty of the language is that it allows us to create narratives that gives us meaning. And meaning ultimately is what makes being on this earth bearable, right? If you have no sense of that, then you quickly descend into despair. And uh, But no, it's not going to be quantified. And that's why I resisted talking about this publicly. You know this for years and years and years, even though I've been studying this for years and years and years. Partially, it's because this coming up against people who are not capable of even because first of all the other thing we do both know is you need to know quite a bit about this before you can have an intelligent conversation and so you can't even talk to people if they don't know anything about it because you're not going to have an intelligent conversation you're going to have a, a silly fight over you know what what beliefs this is not a belief system it's a way of apprehending the world and, and it's poetic and it's 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 larger than we than what no you can't be constrained by a set of rules because if you're just doing it by a set of rules, you're not understanding how the whole story is unfolding. Do you agree with that? I do. I do. And uh, to my understanding, co- uh, connections is definitely a, a good way to express it, uh, uh, discovering those connections. And then I also would add that the deepest understanding I have so far is that our journey, our role, our purpose, in some sense, is to become better and better at expressing the archetypes so that it's as though there's a range of sorts, uh, something like, you know, whatever it is, sun, moon, all of them, there is a high end and then there's a corrupt end. I mean, I always bring up the example of Trump when he corrupts all the archetypes. So think of the the rotten Neptune and that's what he's doing. Think of the rotten sun, whatever. So the logic is, uh, learn, study, tune in to bring them to the high end. So then this will uh, connect you directly. Uh, you'll notice all kinds of things that you're paying attention to. And presumably, and I say presumably, but I think it's true, you start to feel better. And when you start to feel better, mysteriously, things also seem to go better as well. That would be the, you know, this whole thing about the inner reflects yeah, the outer yeah, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. And as above, so yeah. below. Totally true. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's uh, essentially, I agree with you. And by the way, connections, that's another interesting thing. Connections to me reflect making relationships because when you're ma- relating, you're connecting there, I guess, in a way you go to Venus, which is beauty as well. And that would be in a sense, one of the ministers of the sun or the way that you, yeah. you get to understand the sun by moving it to the Venusian I, sense of making connections which aren't it's not putting things in boxes it's just noticing that things are related which is what uh libra and venus are and then uh the sense of as a result of of being connected right right, so, right. yes i agree so i I, th- I felt we had to start with the sun just because in the order of things the luminaries are the ones you really want to start with the sun and the moon but also because the whole concept of enlightenment awareness heart all go are associated with the sun. And this is how we apprehend the world in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And illumination means I become illuminated when I understand light is shone on things that maybe I was closed off to before. Mm-hmm. It was like in the dark cave. And now I, I, I need to illuminate that and become more accepting and aware and start living in an, not in an either or world, but a both and. The idea that two things can exist at the same time. I will leave people with this. Maybe there's a possibility that science and poetry can exist and both are valuable. Maybe we we need to get rid of a scale and maybe we need to talk to each other in a way that says some things are very valuable for one thing. I wouldn't want to live without the scientific world and both of us really love it, love a lot of things to do with science and we appreciate the world creates it. But there's also some value to all the things that are created through the connecting brain. The idea that when you bring things together, the the, the fact that the world is made up of stories as much as it's made up of formulas, right? And uh, yeah, either or, no, I think both ends. So anyway, next next time, let's uh, look, take on the other luminary, the other light, which is the moon, because I think that's often 
the one that gets more maligned because <laughs> it is changeable, because it is complex, just like what it's often projected onto. And let's see where we go with that. And Great. thanks for the conversation today. Okay. I look forward to it. All right. Terrific. Great. Awesome.